Welcome to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefs in the studios of our flagship station, Civic Center TV and 89.3 Lakes FM. In addition, today, as always, we're on TV across Oakland County on Comcast Channel 15 and AT&T Chan Channel 99. Also on City Cable 15 of Southfield and Birmingham Area Municipal Access, serving the Birmingham Bloomfield area. On the radio, 88.1 WBFH, the BIF on uh, in uh, the Birmingham, Bloomfield, and Troy area, 89.3 Lakes FM in West Bloomfield. Other TV stations include Orion Neighborhood Television out there in Lake Orion and the Media Network of Waterford on Channel 10 in the city of Waterford. Join us online on social media by going to our Facebook pages, facebook.com slash civiccentertv15 and facebook.com slash lakesfm. While you're over there, go ahead and uh, give us a like and, and uh, keep up with everything that we're doing, including the Megacast, but also outside of the Megacast as well as including regular programming such as the splash and coverage of live meetings and events all across the greater West Bloomfield area. You can also join us online on our website at civiccentertv.com. Click on the Watch Live link at the top of our home page on your computer web browser or in the left margin of your screen if you're viewing us on your mobile or website however on your mobile phone you'll scroll to that uh, to that a menu on the left side of your screen and out it will pop a menu that will include everything that's on our computer web browser uh, home page as well and you'll click on watch live and there will be live 10 a.m. to 12 noon here on the megacast and our regular programming throughout the day as well including meeting replays other original programming such as the splash imported programming from community partners in the greater west bloomfield area oakland county and all across the state of michigan and other special programming as well you can also join us online live each and every day on my Michigan TV or my my go to their website at my my tv.com it is m y m i t v dot com and then you'll click uh, on browse and click on watch now all of a sudden there will be on the megacast where we are live today on my Michigan TV again m y m i t v dot com if you'd like to learn more about my Michigan TV and go to their website and learn more about how you can subscribe for free where you can get the my my TV app on your smartphone and your smart TV or you want to learn about any of our other partnering television and radio outlets as well go to our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast there we have uh, information about each and every one of our partnering stations links to their websites so that you can learn more about what they're doing in the other 22 hours of the day five days a, a week that we're, that we're not live with them as well as the other 48 hours of the weekend that we're also not live with them that they're doing their own original programming and imported programming as well including replays of this here megacast you can also find more information on our civiccentertv.com megacast page about how to contact us with any ideas you might have about interesting people or projects to talk about here uh, in Oakland County or across the Great Lakes State. And if you missed any episodes of the Megacast, if you miss even five minutes of our show today or yesterday or any other day, you don't have to, to worry about it. It's not just gone and out there in the ether. It's always on our website on civiccentertv.com slash megacast by clicking on our watch full episodes link. If you want to take a two-hour marathon with us, a, really a two-hour thrill ride with us each and every day here on the megacast on your own time or you want to watch individual interviews, all of that is on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. And then right next to that, to the left of that on your computer web browser or just above it on the left margin of your screen if you're viewing us on our homepage menu on your mobile phone is Civic Center's coronavirus webpage. CivicCenterTV.com slash coronavirus there is where you'll find a lot of really important information each and every day about the most interesting and important stories related to COVID-19 and other top news across the state of Michigan. And you'll also find helpful links so that you can get more information on COVID-19 across the board from experts on the front lines who are, who are experts in the medical field, in epidemiology, in virology, who have executed studies on COVID-19, on the vaccines, on precautionary measures, who understand the context of that and can provide you with greater information about what you're, what you're viewing in the research that you're viewing and what that actually means in terms of 
resolving this global crisis that we're in, that's all on our website. We have links to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's COVID-19 webpage, the State of Michigan's Health and Human Services Department webpage, the Oakland County Health Division, where here in Oakland County, you can not only find more information on how to contact the nurse on call hotline, email line, and text line, you can also go to their, to their uh, COVID-19 vaccine page from that link by just clicking on Oakland County on our page, clicking on Vaccine Hub on the next page down, just a little bit down the page, and it'll take you to the Oakland County vaccine website uh, a as well. And then we have links to many of our local municipalities here in Oakland County that have their own information about COVID-19. How is that affecting municipal meetings and municipal business outside of those meetings in West Bloomfield Township? If you click on the West Bloomfield Township link, it'll take you to their COVID-19 webpage. Same thing with uh, Bloomfield Hills, uh, same thing with the city of Birmingham, Troy, Pontiac, and more. All of that at our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast, as well as I, meant, what I mentioned earlier, the top stories each and every day. And uh, we'll kick off today with some good news from the Associated Press. Unemployment claims have fallen to the lowest levels of the entire pandemic. Uh, this again was said from the Associated Press via the Detroit News. The number of Americans applying for unemployment benefits fell to its lowest level since the pandemic began, a sign that the job market is still improving even as hiring has slowed in the past two months. Unemployment claims dropped 36,000 to just 293,000 last week, the second consecutive drop uh, the Labor Department said Thursday. That's the smallest number of people to apply for benefits since March of 2020 when the pandemic intensified. Applications for jobless aid, which generally track the pace of layoffs, have fallen steadily since last spring as businesses uh, struggling to fill jobs have held on to their workers. Hiring has slowed in the past two months, even as companies and other employers have posted a near record number of open jobs. Businesses are struggling to find workers as about three million people People who lost jobs and stopped looking for work since the pandemic have yet to resume their job searches. Economists hope more people would find work, would find work in September as schools reopened, easing child care constraints and enhanced unemployment aid ended nationwide. But the pickup didn't happen with employers adding just 194,000 jobs last month. In a bright spot, the unemployment rate fell from 4.8% uh, to 4.8 percent from 5.2 percent, which is a 0.4 percent drop for those of you interested in mathematics. Those uh, are some of that, uh, though some of that decline occurred because of many of those out of work stopped searching for jobs and were no longer considered unemployed. At the same time, Americans are quitting their jobs in record numbers, with about 3% of workers doing so in August. Workers have been particularly likely to leave their jobs at restaurants, bars, and hotels, possibly spurred by fear of the Delta variant of COVID-19, which was still spreading pretty rapidly in August. Other workers likely uh, to qu uh, quit to take advantage of higher wages offered by businesses with open positions or left jobs because of childcare or children too young to go to school, uh, which has been harder to find. That full article from the Associated Press on the Detroit News' website, we have a, that linked just uh, conveniently for you on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. And pardon me a moment as I employ this bottle of water here. And we're back. Next article on our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. From Bridge Michigan Magazine's coronavirus tracker, one in eight Michigan hospitals are now filled. Uh, hospital beds are now filled with COVID-19 patients. Michigan Health officials reported 110 COVID-19 deaths on Wednesday, and more than 12% of 71,000 recent coronavirus tests have come back positive, the highest rate since May. Over the past two days, the state has averaged 4,335 new cases per day, pushing the seven-day average to 3,797, the highest since April 29th, when it was 3,900. 989. Michigan is averaging 38 cases per day per 100,000 residents, the 12th highest rate in the United States. Northern Michigan, which has lower vaccination rates, is experiencing a surge. Osceola County, uh, Aranac County, 
cases are at 100 cases per 100,000 people per day. Claire is at 91. Uh, Ogama and Montcalm are at 87 and 80, respectively, and Antrim and Muscota and, and Macosta County are at 73 and 71 cases per day per 100,000 residents. Case rates are rising in 49 of the state's 83 counties, though Metro Detroit and most of West Michigan are below 40 cases per day per 100,000 residents. Kent County is at 44 cases per day per 100,000 residents. COVID-19 hospitalizations are also increasing, up 50 from Monday to 2,195 patients. Statewide, 12 percent of hospital beds are occupied by COVID-19 patients. That is up from 9.2 percent on October 1st and 2.6 percent on September 1st, a staggering increase. Of most recent deaths, 58 came, from, uh, came after a review of uh, medical and death records. 109 were in October, four in September, and five Five deaths were previously attributed to COVID-19 uh, and have since been reclassified. That full article from Bridge, Michigan, on our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. And then lastly, on the vaccine front, good news out of Oakland County as the county is outpacing Michigan in COVID-19 vaccine percentages. This from the Oakland Press. While the percentage of Oakland County residents who have received at least one dose of the vaccine is higher than the state, there is concern as new cases of COVID-19 continue to grow among the unvaccinated. Of the more than 4,800 new confirmed and probable cases in Oakland County uh, since September 27th, through October 10th, residents 39 years of age and younger accounted for 54.8% of those new cases. About 283,000 eligible Oakland County residents remain unvaccinated, at least 46,000 of whom are ages 12 to 19 years old. In Oakland County, 71% of residents 12 and older and 88.5% of seniors 65 and older have had at least one shot of one of the COVID-19 vaccines. In Michigan, 63.1% of the population and uh, 12 years of age and up have received at least their first dose. With flu season just getting started, the Oakland County Health Division is offering COVID-19 and flu vaccines at the same time at indoor community cl clinics. In a quote from Oakland County Health Division Medical Director Dr. Russell Faust, quote, getting both the flu and COVID vaccine is vital to reducing the risk of serious illness or death from either virus during this flu season, which is why we are offering both at our indoor community clinics. A number of residents who attended our recent clinics were unaware that the CDC updated its guidance, enabling people to get both vaccines at the same time." And closed quote. Upcoming indoor community clinics will include the Carl Richter Community Center in Holly, United Food and Commercial Workers Local 876 in Madison Heights, the Suburban Collection Showplace in Novi, Welcoming Missionary Baptist Church and Trinity Missionary Baptist Church in Pontiac, and Southfield Pavilion, of course, that is in Southfield. Appointments are strongly encouraged, but walk-ins are also welcome. Click on oaklandcountyvaccine.com or go to civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. Click on the Oakland County link, which will take you to the Oakland County COVID-19 page. Scroll down just a little bit, middle of the page, click on Vaccine Hub, and it will take you directly to that website, which again is oaklandcountyvaccine.com. There you can uh, find addresses, times, and schedule in the appointment. Those who do not have access to the internet may call the Nurse on Call hotline, which is available again on civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, but considering that we're mentioning that this is for those without internet access, I will give you the phone number. The Nurse on Call hotline for Oakland County is 1-800-848-5533. Again, that is 800-848-5533. Three, three, and that number, uh, that hotline is open Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m. for more information. Individuals who schedule their COVID-19 vaccine appointment at an indoor clinic will be asked to indicate whether they would like to receive the flu vaccine as well. Residents may also request it at a time they show up to get their COVID-19 vaccine at an Oakland County indoor clinic. Upcoming drive through vaccine clinics for COVID-19 will be in Pontiac, Novi, and West Bloomfield. The flu vaccine is unavailable at these drive through clinics. However, an update on progress vaccinating Oakland County residents according to the state of Michigan vaccine dashboard as of October 12th uh, of total residents, the total residents 12 and older is 1,091,389. Among those 
in that population who have received their first dose is 808,353. Uh, completely vaccinated among those is 752,749. So the vaccine coverage for ages 12 and older, 71%. Vaccine coverage for 16 and older, 75.1%. And those for senior residents of our 217,617, sorry, 676, uh, residents 65 and older in Oakland County, 182,175 are fully vaccinated and 192,557 are uh, have, at le have at least received their first dose. The vaccine coverage for seniors there then is 88.5%. In Oakland County, the total number of doses administered within the county is 1,502,506. Uh, of the total third and booster doses administered in Region 2, uh, uh, 2 North, which is Oakland, Macomb, and St. Clair County, that number so far, 82,850. Find more information and read that entire article from our friends over at the Oakland Press by going to our website at civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, uh, where you can find all of these articles that we post before our live shows each and every day, uh, which, will, which uh, will be taking you to publications throughout our communities here in Oakland County and southeastern Michigan and across the state where great journalists all across the state of Michigan are keeping this information, are keeping up on this really important information to you and to our communities and providing you the access to public servants who are on the front lines of this pandemic, who are decision makers in this crisis and providing you with in-depth information and the context behind a lot of that information so that you can make informed decisions for yourself and your family based on the current situation that we're dealing with, with the Delta variant, with COVID-19 in general, with the vaccine situation, not only in Oakland County, but across the state of Michigan as well. And we also, of course, got to remind you again at our website, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus. We also have those really important links to the Centers for Disease Control, the state of Michigan, and, uh, and the Oakland County Health Division so that you can learn more factual information from experts in, uh, in medicine, in epidemiology, and in virology, and more from uh, directly from those sources, information you can rely on and information that, that you can also receive context for, for and better understand because while you may want to do your own research, it's probably better to take research, I don't know, from experts who have been doing this for 30, 40 plus years and understand what A, B, and C actually means as opposed to, you know, as opposed to Johnny anybody reading this information and saying, well, let me jump to a conclusion. No, let them jump to a conclusion because they know how to jump. So go to these websites, civiccentertv.com slash coronavirus, click on any of those links, the CDC, the state of Michigan, Oakland County, and get that information that you want to know and that you want to learn about COVID-19, about uh, us dealing with this pandemic, the efficacy of our vaccines, where you can get vaccines, and so much more. We have a great show ahead of you today on this Thursday edition of the Megacast. Coming up next, I'll be speaking with Sarah Shang. She is the Metro Detroit Walk Chair for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention's Metro Detroit Out of Darkness Walk. That is coming up uh, this weekend at 1040. Nicholas Christoff, the founder and executive director of Fleece and Thank You, will join us to talk about Make a Blanket Day in Rochester. Then at 11 o'clock, Hannah Awada, the founder and the owner of Hummus Goodness will join me to talk about her fantastic hummus business. And then 1120, I'll be saying yes and to Jeff Priscorn, Emily Clark, and Clint Lawman from the Guys Upstairs Improv Comedy Troupe. And then we'll cap off today's show with uh, Ashley Sandrigate. Uh, San Magret from uh, the West Michigan Make a Wish chapter as well. That all coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources, call 211-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4-4
211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. How does marijuana affect the teen brain? Our brains are still developing into our 20s. With regular use, marijuana can affect teen brain development. It can affect our brain's circuitry and blood flow and impair thinking, learning, and memory function. Which could hold us back from reaching our potential. Don't let marijuana mess with your brain. Get the facts at michigan.gov slash drug free. Joining us now is Sarah Shang. She is the Metro Detroit Walk Chair for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, leading the charge in planning the Detroit Out of Darkness Walk, joins, and she joins us now on the MegaCast. Sarah, thanks for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. We greatly appreciate it. Appreciate having you on as well. So for those that may are not familiar with the work of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, what, uh, what are some of the things that the organization does to help uh, prevent suicide in our communities and, and to provide programs that are uh, preventative or recovery based for those that may uh, that, that they may be dealing with situations of su a suicide in their family or suicidal ideations themselves. Of course. So the American Foundation ha uh, for Suicide Prevention has a lot of different programs, activities, different things. Um, we have our hands involved in a lot of different stuff. So the money that we raise every year um, goes toward four main areas. So that first area is our community outreach, right, with our Out of the Darkness walks, which are community and campus walks. Um, we have hikes for hope, different things uh, of that nature. And then again, these educational programs, right? So we offer a very uh, wide array of research-based educational programs that we can bring to workplaces, to schools, um, just about anywhere that you'd want them to be um, that teach people about, you know, recognizing the signs of suicide, what the research shows, um, and just pretty much giving people the tools that they need to combat this issue. We also uh, are the largest private funder of research next to the CDC um, for suicide prevention and mental health research. And it's, it's so wonderful. Our research programs are incredible. And then we also have our advocacy programs in which at the national state and local level, we go and lobby for mental health legislation and suicide prevention legislation. Um, we have a big advocacy forum in every single state every year, and then we also have our large national advocacy forum. Um, so we have a lot of different things going on at any given time. We're joined by Sarah Shang. She is the Metro Detroit Walk Chair for the uh, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention's Detroit Out of Doc Darkness Walk. And she joins us now on the Megacast. That walk is on October 16th in downtown Ferndale. Registration is at 8 a.m. The walk is from 10 a.m. until 12.30. So that, that's a, a ra rather long event. So tell us a little bit about what will be happening uh, at that two and a half hour long event there on October 16th in downtown Ferndale, what people may be experiencing. Experiencing and, and how uh, this, this event will benefit your organization. Of course. So again, um, the, these events are designed to do a couple of different things, right? So it's designed to build this sense of community and impactfulness and knowing that you are not alone in your struggles or your loss. Um, if you have lost someone to suicide or you struggle yourself, again, with these ideations, um, and there's a lot of different things going on. Um, these walks are also, again, they raise money to help fund the various programs and the various research and advocacy and all these other uh, different things that we do. So we say registration opens at 8 a.m. Registration can happen online before that and you don't necessarily have to get there at 8 a.m. So there's the online option, but then there's also the walk-up option, which again opens at 8 a.m. Um, starting at 8 a.m., however, we will have a variety of different activities. So it's not just a walk. Um, it's an event with a lot of meaningful, different, impactful uh, areas. So there's an area for kids, there's an area for crafts. We also have a memory area, which allows um, survivors of loss to share photos of their loved ones and give, you know, talk about why they walk. And um, then we also have our hope area with, in which um, participants and attendees can leave their little messages of hope. It's actually really cool. We have a big wooden hope, like the words hope, 
for people to come up with markers and write their messages of hope on. It is it's so great. We have different photos. We will also be having live music by the Stone Temple Pilots lead singer, Jeff Goot. He will be aiding us in our opening ceremony, which starts at 10. Um, and then we also have Amy Andrews from Channel uh, from Fox 2 Detroit, mm -hmm. who uh, will be emceeing the event for us. It's going to be it's so great, um, and it's it's very impactful. A lot of people tend to hear the you know word suicide prevention walk and think it's the sad thing, and it's really not. It is one of the most uplifting, impactful events I have ever been to. I've ever attended. Um, it really is again this this feeling that you are not alone. In you know, in your struggles, in your loss, and in whatever way that you are connected to this cause. You can learn more information about the work of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention by visiting their website at AFSP.org. That is AFSP.org. And again, that walk is in downtown Ferndale uh, from 10 a.m. until 12.30. Uh, you can learn more information and register either on site there at 8 a.m. on the day of the event or by sending an email to Metro Detroit at AFSP.org. Again, that is Metro Detroit at AFSP.org. SP.org. And Sarah, I'd like to talk more about uh, some of the preventative programs that are available for, uh, for people that may uh, be struggling right now or that may be uh, having suicidal ideations. What are some of, the, some of those uh, helpful resources that are available not only to people that may be experiencing these ideations or be struggling with their mental health at this moment in time through your organization, but also for families that are helping, uh, they're helping uh, their loved ones through these situations or after these situations as well. Absolutely. So um, again, like I said we, earlier, we offer a variety of different educational programs. So we have our most generic program that we deliver the most often. It's called Talk Safe Lives. And it's essentially shows um, participants how to teaches them about suicide, but also teaches them about how to approach somebody, how to have, we call it a hashtag real convo, have a real conversation right? Um, how to talk about it with your loved ones or your family members or anyone that you may think may be having these suicidal thoughts or ideations or any type of mental health struggle. Um, and there's a different, we have different variations of that. So we have one that is geared toward the LGBTQ community. We also have a uh, guns and firearms safety module. Um, we also have a module for seniors. Um, and then we also have a program geared towards um, middle school and high school. It is called More Than Sad. Um, there is a teacher module, a parent module, and, a, and the module then for the students. And it's taught in those three parts so that everybody has those resources to get, um, to be able to have these discussions with these students and things like that. Um, then we also have a new program that uh, the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention just rolled out. Um, and it's Gizmo, oh, Gizmo's Prevention Oh gosh, I can't remember the name, the exact name, but it's Gizmo for Prevention, which is essentially geared toward elementary school students. And he's a little, he's a little puppy, and he's um, adorable. And it's a book, it's a read along um, that gives that's, that's again research based that can give these you know these young kids kind of these you know how to how to talk about and how to express how you're feeling about your own mental health in a way that makes sense to them at that age group. Um, so. As far as direct services, we do not offer direct services um, because we are research and uh, health-based. So we um, oftentimes uh, we, we help um, facilitate um, support groups, which a list of those can be found on the AFSP website as well. And then we also refer people out to organizations that we often partner with. Um, we send people off a lot of times to like Common Ground or um, other other organizations that we know of, um, and then also there's, always, there's also always the Lifeline, the National Suicide Lifeline. We're joined by Sarah Shang. She is the Metro Detroit Walk Chair for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention's Detroit Out of Darkness Walk. That walk again on Saturday, October 16th from 10 a.m. until 1230 in downtown Ferndale. You can register on site at 8 a.m. the day of the event or by uh, contacting uh, Sarah and her team at Metro Detroit at AFSP.org. That is Metro Detroit at AFSP.org. And 
terms of these programs uh, going into the school communities, being provided to teachers, being provided to students, uh, and, and to the general community, when should these conversations really start? Because uh, on the one hand, you can have these conversations in times of tragedy and, and in times of recovery, but at the and it, but at the same time, you, you want to also have these conversations beforehand uh, as a preventative measure to let people know that there are, that there are resources out there that, that that they have outlet outlets to speak to, whether it be the national hotline uh, or, or text line or or others in their community. Uh, when should these conversations really start with, particularly with kids uh, and with families as well? Because uh, in some cases, the earlier these conversations are had, the better access people have to resources and know how to utilize those resources, and that can save a lot of lives. Absolutely. So I think that, I mean, we at AFSP are all about have the conversation now. Um, there's no time like the present, I suppose. Um, because you don't, again, you don't want to get into, you know, you don't want to have to be, have to do it out of grief or, you know, coming out of a survivorship. Um, you know, that's not the most ideal way to do it. And so, I mean, the best time for these conversations to happen is when people think it, it is the best, I suppose, is the best way, I guess I could answer that. Um, you know, and we, we bring these programs free of charge to anybody who wants them. You can, they can submit a program request on our chapter page if this is something they'd be interested in bringing to uh, their school, their workplace, uh, PTA group, whichever, it doesn't matter. And that can be found at www.afspmichigan.org slash Michigan, I'm sorry. Yeah, AFSP.org slash Michigan is where you can find all that information. And you can find more information on uh, all the resources from the national organization at AFSP.org as well. And, and, then, and the, the Michigan page includes information on how to volunteer, updates on the work that's being done by the local chapter, their programs in the local area, as well as upcoming events such as the uh, Detroit Out of Darkness walk that will occur this Saturday, October 16th, from 10 a.m. to 12.30 in downtown Ferndale, again, you can register to participate on site there at 8 a.m. on Saturday or by contacting Sarah and her team at Metro Detroit at AFSP.org. Again, that email is Metro Detroit at AFSP.org. Sarah, just another couple minutes with you before we'll say goodbye today. Is there anything else at this moment in time that would be important for people to know as they prepare for uh, the Detroit Out of Darkness walk on Saturday or more about the work of the AFSP Michigan chapter and, and the national organization? Of course. So with respect to the Metro Detroit Out of the Darkness Walk, so it is in downtown Ferndale, um, and it is going to be on nine miles between Woodward and Bermuda. So um, it's that whole local area um, in that on that strip of nine miles, and then the uh, parking lot of the Ferndale Library. There's lots of parking, public parking uh, lots around the area, including the dot parking structure um, for the city. And so they have been, um, so gracious in helping us facilitate, actually helping our walkers to figure out the parking situation. So there is a diagram on the walk website, which is where people can also register as well. They don't have to wait till the day of or send an email. They can register um, right on the website. And so that for the walk itself, so that is um, www.afsp.org slash Metro Detroit. Um, and it is completely free to register as well. I, I do want to to say that so it's not like other a lot of other walks where you have a fee a minimum fee you do have to in order to get like a walk t-shirt you have to raise 150 dollars by walk day but if that's not within your capabilities that's fine we just ask that everybody registers um it's just it's such a great event it really is it's so powerful and so impactful um we really and, and the weather is supposed to be relatively nice too from from what i'm understanding um so it'll just be it's a really great day and again, that walk Saturday, October 16th in downtown Ferndale, 10 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And that uh, uh, registration begins at 8 a.m. You can learn more information and register before that 8 a.m. registration period on the day of by emailing metrodetroit at afsp.org. Sarah, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. The city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. We work together to protect water resources for everyone. Most of the pollution entering our rivers is carried by rainwater that runs off roads, parking lots, and rooftops. A rain garden helps catch stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and their plants 
help dirty runoff soak into the ground. You can do your part to help keep our water clean. Learn about rain gardens and native plants. So consider a rain garden in your home landscaping. Catch the runoff with a rain garden. There's one water and it's ours to protect. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. We work together to protect water resources for everyone. Most of the pollution entering our rivers is carried by rainwater that runs off roads, parking lots, and rooftops. A rain garden helps catch stormwater runoff. Rain gardens and their plants help dirty runoff soak into the ground. You can do your part to help keep our water clean. Learn about rain gardens and native plants. So consider a rain garden in your home landscaping. Catch the runoff with a rain garden. There's one water and it's ours to protect. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was gonna die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary. And if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not get your vaccine? I don't want this to happen to anybody else. A message from the staff of Michigan's Crime Victim Compensation Program. Anyone can be a victim of crime. And suffer lasting trauma, physically, emotionally, and financially. But you are not alone. If you're struggling financially due to a crime, we're here for you. Find out if you qualify for crime victim compensation. Call 877-251-7373 or visit michigan.gov slash crime victim. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, Division of Victim Services. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keith alongside our studio producer and board operator Calvin Brown in our studios at Green Media Center in West Bloomfield Township where we broadcast live each and every day on a number of other TV and radio stations as well as online in a number of places as well. Learn more information about everybody that broadcasts the show along with us each and every day and find all of our episodes and our interviews on demand by going to civiccentertv.com slash megacast or just going to civiccentertv.com and clicking on the Megacast link either at the top of the page on your computer web browser or on your cell phone web browser in the left margin of your screen. We're, we're, we're joined now by Nicholas Christock. He's the founder and the executive director of Fleece and Thank You, and they have an event uh, coming up uh, uh, Saturday, October 16th, and running through the next week's Saturday, October 23rd. Uh, make a Blanket Day, which will kick off, uh, of course, as I said, the Saturday at Stony Creek High School, and he joins us now on the Megacast. Nick, thanks for being with us again. Hey, Tyler, thanks so much for having me. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday to you as well. So uh, let's talk about Make a Blanket Day uh, in Rochester. This is a, a hybrid event where uh, you're going to attempt to make about a thousand blankets for kids facing extended stays in the hospital. So how will this work as a hybrid uh, event? It does kick off at Stony Creek High School. So what opportunities are there in person and what opportunities are there virtually for people to participate? Awesome. At Fleece and Thank You, we uh, serve every single children's hospital and unit in the state with colorful, comfortable fleece blankets. And so this Make a Blanket Day event is a community-wide event, complimentary to attend. So there's no cost for someone to register and attend this event. It's going to be happening on Saturday, like you said, from 12 to 3 p.m. at Stony Creek High School. And we have two great options for someone to get involved. The first is they can come with us this Saturday and make blankets on site at Stony Creek. We'll be there from 12 to three, rain or shine. We've got tents, also the ability to move inside if we need to. And we'll be making blankets from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. If someone's not comfortable being in person or schedule doesn't permit, we have a drive-through option as well. They can just register online, drive through. They don't even need to get out of their car. They'll pull up to the circle there. 
we'll put blankets right in their trunk. They'll be able to make them over the next seven days. And then on the 23rd of October, we have a drop off event where they can come and drop those blankets off. So multiple ways for someone to tie into the event. And even beyond that, should there be uh, people that are unable to attend and there are extra blanket kits still available, uh, there are other ways too that they can pick up these blanket kits, make these blankets, return them to your organization and still participate even after the event is already gone in process. There are, yeah, two ways for sure. One is right on the event page. You can get kits shipped right to your home. If you'd like to make blankets from home and can't make it out with us or you're too far to make it out with us. Well, also, if there's any blankets that don't get made in person this Saturday, those will be held at Chief Financial Credit Union in Rochester there. And you'll be able to stop in and pick up blankets from there while supplies last. I can tell you that normally, if there are any extra blankets, those supplies are gone usually that Monday because so many people want to come and make those and they're gone pretty quick. So making it with us in person, uh, you can do the drive through or get them shipped right to your home or take advantage of that additional uh, pickup at Chief Financial during the week. And, and just for reference, that uh, pickup at Chief Financial Credit Union, uh, should there be extra kits available, will start on Monday, October 18th. Their hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., but they are closed from 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. So, uh, Chris, why this uh, event, this hybrid event at this time of the year uh, for making blanket kits? Is this something that uh, it's regularly done year by year by your organization, Fleece and Thank You, or is this uh, triggered by the current situation uh, that kids are experiencing in hospitals or both? Yeah, this is an annual event that we hold in Rochester every year, right around this time frame in the fall. Um, two years ago, we had about 1,500 people attend this event, and we actually set a Guinness World Record for most fleece blankets made in an eight hour period. It was a really wild event, made over 2000 blankets for kids in the hospital. So this time, obviously, given the current environment, wanna make it safe uh, and effective and just able for anyone to be able to tie in. Um, so we're going for a thousand blankets in person or drive through. And then, you know, definitely next fall of 2022, our hope is to be back in person and uh, setting another world record together. We're joined by Nicholas Christock. He is the founder and executive director of Fleece and Thank You. Uh, uh, joining us to talk a little bit about uh, Make a Blanket Day 2021, which begins this Saturday, October 16th at Stony Creek High School. There's also a virtual option as well. And the event runs through Saturday, October 23rd. And so uh, the goal for this event uh, for is, uh, is uh, a thousand blankets blankets in seven days when these blankets are ultimately made when your organization collects these hopefully 1,000 or more uh, blankets where where do they then go from from there what process do they go through after they are made and, and after they are returned to your organization before they end up in the hands of these children yeah, after the blankets come back to us from the event they come to our warehouse here in Farmington Hills Michigan where they go through a really strict quality control process that culminates with them going through hospital grade washing and drying units. When they emerge from that process, they are 99.999% germ free. They get individually wrapped and sealed, and then they get delivered to one of our 22 hospital partners where with every single children's hospital unit in the state of Michigan to make sure that they have enough comfort. That is a germ free blanket that we deliver. So the next time that gets touched by a patient, whether they have immune compromised system or not, when they open up that blanket, it is guaranteed, you know, to have no germs on it and be colorful and comfortable. We're joined by Nicholas Christock. He is the founder and the executive director of Fleece and Thank You. Learn more information about the organization and how you can participate in Make a Blanket Day 2021 or participate in producing blankets and volunteering with this organization throughout the rest of the year by visiting their website at Fleece and Thank You. Uh, dot org. So outside of this event, are there other events that are planned throughout the year for making these blankets or what other needs uh, are there to cover uh, everything that your organization does throughout the year outside of special events such as this? We work with about 400 groups a year to do individual group blanket making events. So whether that be a business, a church, a school, a reading club, you name it, a family party at Thanksgiving, we are always working with groups around the state to make blankets every single day throughout the year because the reality is in the state of michigan about 30,000 kids a year go into the hospital and have to stay overnight at least one night for inpatient treatment it's our annual mission to make 30,000 blankets so whether you're tapping into one of our big community events 
like Make a Blanket Day Rochester. We have another big community event coming up in Macomb County in December that's similar to this event. You can tap into one of those or you can just make blankets with your group at any other time throughout the year. We keep it simple and we solve a very simple problem uh, with color and comfort. That's 30,000 blankets a year. Always, always, always looking for more blanket makers, big and small. We're joined by Nicholas Christock, founder and executive director of F Fleece and Thank You, joining us on the Megacast. Again, Make a Blanket Day 2021. Uh, that event kicks off Saturday, October 16th uh, at Stony Creek High School in Rochester. Uh, there will also be hybrid options available as well. The event concludes the following Saturday, October 23rd. There are also opportunities um, should you be unable to attend, and there are extra blanket kits available to pick up those kits from Chief Financial credit union in rochester hills beginning on monday of next week october 18th their hours there for pickup 9 a.m to 5 p.m excluding 1 30 p.m to 2 30 p.m of course you can also order kits to ship directly to your home again fleece and thank you Dot org. And so, uh, Nick, take us through a little bit of the process. When someone does get one of the blanket kits, uh, how, what do they receive? How long does it typically take to put these together? Uh, how easy of a process is it from start to finish, from receiving the kit to returning to the kit for these volunteers to participate in the work of your organization? Yeah, we make making blankets really easy. So I've got a blanket kit right here. It's really just two pieces of fabric, a print and a solid, and then our special video message patch pressed onto that fabric. And so making a blanket is really just a couple easy steps of spreading it out on a nice flat table, using scissors to cut squares out of the corners, cutting strips around the outside, and then tying those strips together in a double knot. There's a really unique part of fleece and thank you blankets where every fleece and thank you blanket you make, you can also make a personal video message. So Tyler can make a blanket and a video that will travel to Chloe in the hospital and Chloe can actually send Tyler a message back through the technology that we've built. So it really brings it full circle. Another important point to add is for this weekend's event, I don't know how often you buy groceries. I usually try to buy mine once a week, but everyone who attends the event this weekend, thanks to our sponsors at Kroger, will be entered to win free groceries for a year. And we're going to pick that raffle winner, but everyone who attends the event this weekend will be entered to win free groceries for a year. I don't know about you, but I would love to take uh, free groceries for a year. That would be amazing. Yeah, free groceries for a year is pretty satisfying, but making a child's day uh, is even more satisfying. It's the truth. And, it's the and truth. so uh, you can you can take care of both potentially at the same time by participating in this event. And again, more information on this at fleeceandthankyou.org. And again, Make a Blanket Day 2021 begins this Saturday, October 16th from 12 noon to 3 p.m. at Stony Creek High School. There are virtual options available that you can learn more about on their website. And then there are other opportunities if you're unable to attend the event, but do want to pick up some of these blanket kits, should there be extra kits available, you'll be able to stop by 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, excluding 1.30 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. at Chief Financial Credit Union in Rochester Hills. Uh, and then uh, that will uh, you, you'll be able to also drop the blankets off there as well once they're completed up until Friday, October 29th. We're joined by Nicholas Christock, the founder and the executive director of Fleece and Thank You with us on the Megacast. And so, so Nick, let's go, let's go back. We've talked about this previously about uh, some of the origins of why you started uh, Fleece and Thank You. But ultimately, what is the impact of the work that yourself, that your organization, and that your volunteers do? What, what impact does that end up having on these children and on their families? Yeah, the impact can be best described through uh, putting you in the situation. If I told you right now, Tyler, instead of talking about fleece blankets, we're actually gonna go outside right now and we're gonna run a marathon. I don't know about you, but I'm not in shape to run a marathon right now. And if we went outside and I took you to that starting line, you'd be feeling lots of things, nervous, anxious, scared, not sure if you could run the race, what was gonna happen along the way if you'd be able to finish. For tons of kids every single day throughout the year in Michigan, they enter a hospital room. It's the plain white sheets, the dark beige wallpaper. They're at the starting line of a marathon that they didn't choose to run, but they have to run it. And they're nervous, anxious, and scared. But now imagine if you're at that starting line and someone's standing there with a big sign and you squint and you look closer and it says, Tyler, you can do this. We believe in you. We're here for you. You're instantly less anxious to run that race. And when we put that colorful piece of comfort waiting on the bed for that patient, a lot of our families and patients say it was the first chance we had that day 
to have a reason to have hope that everything was going to be okay. When they watch that video message, they'll often say this was the first time all day that we've had to smile. Because for those families, everything about that day is uncertain and scary. They're at the starting line of a race where it's a diagnosis they didn't want to hear, a room they don't want to be in. And you're there right on that video message, cheering them out at the starting line and giving them that piece of color and comfort. And it makes a world of a difference for a patient and family to start their race on that note. So then, uh, Nick Christock, we're lost, the founder and executive director of Fleeson. Thank you. Uh, at the, who uh, does end up receiving these blankets? Which children that are hospitalized? Are there certain are there certain patients that do receive these and others that maybe don't? Does it depend on the amount of time that they're going to be in the hospital, or does that uh, not matter? Right now, we work with pediatric inpatients. So that's any child under the age of 18 that's going to be admitted and have to stay at least one night in the hospital. It's not their, not their pillows, not their sheets, not their blanket, not their room, and not their normal. That's who we target with our blankets. We're joined by Nicholas Christock, founder and executive director of Fleece and Thank You, joining us on the Megacast. Uh, and, of course, again, Make a Blanket Day Rochester 2021 begins October 16th, as this week's Saturday, from noon to 3 p.m. Uh, in person at Stony Creek High School. There are virtual uh, and hybrid options available as well, and uh, you'll be able to, p to pick up blankets. Uh, you'll be able to... Uh, pick up blanket kits should they be available at uh, at uh, Chief Financial Credit Union in Rochester Hills. That is uh, open 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday, and it is closed 1:30 p.m. to 2:30 p.m. It is also a drop-off location. They'll be taking those drop-offs. Should you be able to pick up those kits, um, make the blankets, and return them up until Friday, October 29th, uh, at that same location again, Chief Financial Credit Union in Rochester Hills. Learn more information about Make a Blanket Day 2021 by visiting Fleece and thank you's website at fleece and thank you.org and so uh, beyond volunteers nick uh, obviously that's that's in, that's entirely necessary to make the volume of blankets that your organization makes every year especially to uh, attempt a feat such as making a thousand blankets in a seven day period beyond that what else uh, is needed for your organization to be able to do its work from the community uh, should they be able to contribute uh, to your organization and help out in another way beyond making blankets? Yeah, we keep it pretty simple, Tyler. I mean, someone can give their time, they can give their dollars, or they can give both. They can make a blanket from home, make it with their group, just tell other groups about it. They can physically come into our warehouse and give their time here uh, on site. Uh, they can provide a donation for some of our workforce development programs where we have young adults and adults with disabilities that come into our warehouse and do all the back end operations of making blanket kits. So many ways to tie in and we make it very, very easy from sponsoring a blanket for a kiddo to making one yourself. There's really a lot of ways for someone to get tied in and we make it easy to provide comfort for kids in the hospital. And that's what it's all about, like you said. We're joined by Nicholas Christock. He is the founder and executive director of Fleece and Thank You. Joining us today on the Megacast and uh, Nicholas, just a few more minutes with us uh, today. Uh, uh, at this moment in time, is there anything else that is uh, important for our audience to know about Fleece and thank you about Make a Blanket Day 2021 uh, or anything else that would be interesting for us to be keeping on the lookout for with your organization in the near future. Yeah, read it at the details of uh, this weekend, uh, Saturday, October 16th. It's going to be at Stony Creek High School from 12 to 3 p.m. Come on out, make blankets with us on site, choose the virtual option, make them from home. Many ways to tie in there. We're doing a similar event to this in Macomb County on December 4th. Uh, that one is sponsored by First State Bank. So some more details to come out. You can find all of this, though, right on our website, fleeceandthankyou.org. Really, if you do anything, check out fleeceandthankyou.org and go to our impact page and just watch a couple of videos from kids in the hospital. Those response videos really tell the whole story. When you watch Joshua, who received his blanket from Cameron, thanking Cameron, and it's a seven-year-old thanking another seven-year-old, the heart of empathy just doesn't get any stronger than that. 
We're joined by Nicholas Christoff, the founder and executive director of Fleece and Thank You. Again, at their website, fleeceandthankyou.org, you can find more information about volunteering with the organization, uh, order some of their blanket kits so that you can provide that warmth, that comfort, uh, and that uh, little bit of joy to children all across our local area, where you can also donate to the organization and then find out more about their events and even schedule some corporate volunteering uh, or corporate partnerships as well if you and your business would like to partner with Fleece and thank you. Nick, thank you for your time again and, and for telling us more about this upcoming event. Thanks so much, Tyler. Have a great day. You as well. Again, Make a Blanket Day, Rochester 2021, kicks off Saturday, October 16th from 12 noon to 3 p.m., the in-person version at least, at Stony Creek High School in Rochester Hills. There are hybrid options available to participate in Make a Blanket Day as well. Learn more information about how you can participate in a hybrid fashion if, or if you can't attend that event this weekend by going to Fleece and Thank You's website. That is Fleece and Thank You. Dot org. Fleece and thank you. Dot org. We're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we will go from talking about volunteerism to talking about some tasty food. Well, we'll be joined by uh, two people from uh, Hummus Goodness coming up next to kick off the 11 o'clock hour. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. You see certain things get reincarnated in your children. My daughter is very much inspired by my wife's artistic pursuits. So my daughter started making necklaces. She makes what we call affirmation fashion. I tell her every day that your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. Your black is beautiful. And if there's anything better than being beautiful, it's being smart. And if there's anything better than being smart, it's being kind. And reaffirming that every day is our method of making sure her chin never drops. My dad wasn't around. And I remember riding a bike and falling off and cutting myself. And me never would just want to get back on it. People ask, how your children learn how to ride a bike? And you did. I didn't teach them. I just created an environment where they taught themselves. And all I had to do was be there. Whether you're the city, the county, or the Huron River Watershed Council. As partners working together to protect our water resources, we agree. Pet waste is the source of harmful bacteria in the Huron River. When it's left on the ground, it can wash into the storm drains. These lead directly to our streams. No filters, no treatment. Here's one thing we know that can help keep our water clean. Pick up pet waste and trash it. Pick up pet waste and trash it. So pick up pet waste and trash it. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. Who is struggling right now? I am. My son is. Many are struggling with anxiety, depression, and substance use. Before it becomes a crisis, reach out to MyCal, the Michigan Crisis and Access Line for free confidential support 24-7. Available in the Upper Peninsula in Oakland County. Just call or text 1-844-44-MYCAL or chat online at michigan.gov slash mycal. A message from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. I couldn't breathe at all. There was lots of talk about putting me on a ventilator. I thought I was going to die. I was 39 weeks pregnant and had a scheduled C-section. During that time, I got COVID and was hospitalized for a month. I had a blood clot in my lungs. It caused me to go into right-sided heart failure. I was really scared. I kept texting my husband and my mom, telling them how scared I was, and I was worried that he was gonna grow up without a mom. And then I was worried if, when I did get home, that he wouldn't know who I was. You know, being 27 and a mom and a wife and having that all almost taken away from me. It's scary, and if a vaccine can prevent that from happening, why not? Get your vaccine. I don't want this to happen to anybody else.
Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside Calvin Brown, our studio producer and board operator in our studios in West Bloomfield Township, where we broadcast live from 10 a.m. to 12 noon, Monday through Friday on the Megacast here in Oakland County and all across the state of Michigan. Learn more information about the show, about all of our partnering TV, radio, and web outlets, and find our episodes and interviews on demand by going to our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. We're pleased to be joined by Hannah Awada, the founder and owner of Hummus Goodness, as well as Laura Loser now, Alara Loser now, to talk about Hummus Goodness. Ladies, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having us. Thank we you so appreciate much. it. So tell us a little bit about Hummus Goodness. Uh, let's start with you, Hannah. Uh, how did this or how did this begin? Uh, wh where did you start this company, and, and, and ultimately, what prompted you uh, to start this business? First, thanks for having us. We're really excited to be here. Um, Hummus Goodness, believe it or not, did not start in Michigan. I was an expat wife living overseas with my uh, husband and three children. We were in Shanghai, China, and I went to a party and I took some hummus and everybody loved it and said, well, you saw us hummus? And I said, why not? There's an opportunity, let's see what happens. And I started a small company there in 2017, selling uh, hummus to the local expat community. Uh, unfortunately, in June of 2018, we were sent back to the US and the first question everybody asked was, will you start hummus uh, here in Michigan? Initially, I was reluctant to do so uh, because there's so much hummus out there. But uh, my friends, they really encouraged me to do so. So we, uh, I started off in uh, April of 2019 at St. James Church in downtown Birmingham. In October of 2019, Laura came on as my amazing business partner and, uh, you know, a uh, great friend. And we uh, have now moved um, from 2019 from the St. James Church to our new facility in Southfield uh, as we had outgrown the space uh, there. So. And, what's, and what's really interesting about your company uh, is the the emphasis on ingredient transparency and and, and using natural products in producing uh, your your hummus and producing your product and when uh, when you say ingredient transparency, what is meant by that and, and why such an emphasis on that with your product in particular? Absolutely, uh, I'm Lebanese. I grew up on hummus and hummus has to have certain ingredients in it if you really want to call it hummus. It needs to have olive oil. It needs to have fresh lemon juice, not citric acid. It should have cloves of fresh garlic, not garlic powder. Uh, really good beans. So we use a non-GMO bean that we source uh, from the west side of the country uh, that's not spurred pesticides. So hummus is supposed to be your fresh, healthy dip. But unfortunately, over the last few years, and it's become more mainstream, it's lost what makes it fresh and healthy. So that's kind of why. So all of our ingredients are clearly written on our label. And uh, we're always happy to tell our people where we get our, um, our ingredients from. Our beets come from the Eastern market, for example. Um, our tahini is a Michigan made tahini. So yeah. Well, our producer Larry tells me that you, uh, that, that you uh, Hannah, and you, and you Lara, have uh, a hummus appetizer recipe that you'd like to uh, show us here. Uh, if, you, if you'd like, you can go ahead and do that right now. Absolutely. So um, the appetizer is a really, really simple appetizer. As the holiday season is approaching and you get really busy, nobody really has time to make a very complicated appetizer. So we're going to show you the easiest appetizer using our fresh beet hummus. It is made with fresh roasted beets that we get from the Eastern market. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to take the container of hummus, leave it exactly as it is. You're going to top it with goat cheese or feta. And if you're vegan, you can omit these items. And then you're gonna to top it with some crushed pistachios. Drizzle it with a little bit of honey. We call it this like 60 second easiest appetizer. Serve it with some fire hook crackers. We personally like this uh, cracker food or a baguette. And this is what you end up with. Very nice. It's a super easy, fresh recipe for hummus using lots of Michigan products and, uh, yeah. 
And what's great about that too is much like uh, much like with your hummus, you know what exactly what's going into it. Uh, it's very sim it's it's a very it's very simply produced and it's very true to exactly what you're saying and it is and to the to the aim of your product as well. Do you have uh, other recipes like that that people can then get access to? Uh, that also include your hummus, of, of course, uh, so that they can get more creative with it as well. Because in some cases, people are using hummus as a dip, or they're using it as, an, as so, something they add into uh, their cooking recipes. But for some people, they, they, they uh, would like to experiment more in the kitchen with, with, different, with different, different recipes, but they need a little bit of guidance. Absolutely. We have, our, on our website, as well as our Instagram page, we have all of the five flavors have recipes that we have created over time um, and super simple ones, just like you've seen here today, make it really easy, open the container up, add a few items or a single item on top and serve. So we really, we like to make sure that it's as simple and as easy as possible because we know that we are busy and we wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to enjoy the, the greatest hummus with the best ingredients. We're joined by Hannah Awada. She is the founder and the owner of Hummus Goodness, as well as her business partner, Laura Loser. Joining us on the Megacast, you can learn more information and find those, those recipes from Hummus Goodness on their website, hummusgoodness.com, and just click on the recipes link at the top of their page. And uh, it, it is... Uh, it is well appreciated hummus, of course. It is award-winning uh, hummus here in the in the state of Michigan as well. But in the past, uh, in past May, actually, Hummus Goodness won the Startup to Watch Award at the Making It in Michigan Awards uh, a as well. And so, uh, if people are interested in in purchasing this Michigan-made product, where can they find Hummus Goodness in stores nearby? Absolutely, we are sold in 70 stores throughout the Michigan and Northern Ohio area. You can find us at Papa Joe's, Nina Sabaggio's, Plum Market, Rivertown Market in downtown Detroit, even as far as Leland Mercantile up in northern Michigan, uh, Churchill's in Toledo. So and again, and those, there's a full list of stores on our website as well. Yeah, and again, their website, hummusgoodness.com. If you click on Find Us or, or log in hummusgoodness.com slash locations, you'll be able to search all the places where you can find hummus goodness across the state of Michigan. We're joined by Hannah Awada. She is the founder and the owner of Hummus Goodness, as well as her business partner, Laura Loser, uh, joining us to talk about hummus goodness. Again, their website, hummusgoodness.com. And so you uh, have a new facility in Southfield that you're now producing your hummus out of. How has that changed, having that facility uh, instead of your previous locations where you've been producing this hummus? How has that changed your ability to uh, create your product efficiently, uh, build your business, and also to expand this Michigan-made product? Well, it's been phenomenal, first thing. It's been really a big transition for us. We have now been able to really expand in terms of having a distributor. We have something as simple as a dock in the back which allows trucks to come in and come out and that right there is key for growth and our production facility is several times larger um, the capacity to hold fresh hummus in our refrigerator several times larger um, several tens of times larger than our last facility and we really we needed to move up into a bigger facility to really be able to take on adding stores, getting growth, and really uh, making our product more widely available throughout the state. We're joined by Hannah Awada, the founder and owner of Hummus Goodness, as well as her business partner, Lara Loser. Learn more information about Hummus Goodness at their website, civics at uh, their website, hummusgoodness.com. You can find this entire in interview uh, and more information about Hummus Goodness uh, on our website on demand later on if you're just joining us at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. So in terms of expanding your business uh, and continuing to do so during the pandemic, what sort of challenges were you uh, what did you face over the last year and a half, two years in managing your business and continuing to expand your business? And uh, how did you overcome them or how are you dealing with them still? I'm going to be honest, when the pandemic hit, we were so nervous. We were really worried, would we continue to grow? Would we become, you know, would we disappear off the shelves? Would people still want to go and, and get the fresh hummus? And we were really pleasantly surprised to see that even with the pandemic, and maybe especially with the pandemic, people were really keen on supporting local, 
They were keen on shopping in local grocery stores and picking up local products. And we did see a lot of growth uh, during the COVID time, which actually allowed us and encouraged us to, if we could get over COVID and we could overcome that, we could overcome anything, which gave us the, you know, the courage to then move on to our own facility. But now with COVID uh, changing and affecting the economy and things like this, you know, we like everybody else, we have staff shortages. So if you're looking for a job, let us know. Um, we have staff shortages, supply chain logistics that we're, we're working through, but so far we're just keeping our heads down and doing the best we can. And I, I'll have Laura talk about what we did during COVID to support the local community, sure. because we're really proud of that. Yeah, in the beginning of the pandemic, we sort of stepped back and said, how can we help? What can we do um, to really help the frontline workers? And so what we ended up doing was partnering with a local organization and we were distributing hummus to them and they were taking it directly to the hospitals throughout the metro area and providing um, healthy snacks for frontline workers that were unable to leave the hospital due to the you know overwhelming number of cases that were coming across. So we feel like we, small, 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 small way, helped a little bit make somebody's life a little bit easier uh, as a frontline worker by providing fresh, clean hummus um, in, a, in a snack size for them. We're joined by Lara Loser and Hannah Awada. They are, they are from uh, Hummus Goodness, joining us on the Megacast. Learn more information uh, about Hummus Goodness, a product made right here in the state of Michigan and all the places that you can find Hummus Goodness in stores as well as recipes at their website, hummusgoodness.com. Again, it's hummusgoodness.com. And so, Hannah, you talk about availabilities uh, for staffing right, right now. What what uh, positions are available with Hummus Goodness for people that want to work for a Michigan company, a growing Michigan company, and are looking for a job? Again, honestly, for food production workers, people who are interested in working on making the hummus with us, uh, helping us with the packaging, the boxing. Um, we provide lunch to our workers, which is a nice little uh, perk. It's, you know, we all sit down together and we eat lunch, which is really nice. and. Um, but yeah, just like a really eager food production worker looking to learn more about the food world and how things are done behind the scenes. We're joined by Hannah Wada, the founder and owner of Hummus Goodness, as well as Lara Loser uh, from Hummus Goodness as well. Learn more information about their business at hummusgoodness.com, as well as where you can find uh, Hummus Goodness in stores all across the state of Michigan, including down here in southeastern Michigan in Oakland County. Just another few minutes with the, with the two of you today. Uh, is there anything else that people should know about your, about your business, about Hummus Goodness? Uh, at this time or uh, other maybe interesting things that people can be on the lookout for with your business as it continues to grow here in the state of Michigan. Absolutely. They come in five, um, to begin, they come in five amazing flavors. So there is the classic hummus, mm -hmm. uh, light, clean flavor. There's an amazing, our signature, it is a balsamic, which is roasted garlic with balsamic glazed onion. We have a spicy for our heat lovers. Laura's absolute favorite, the taco, which just needs a bag of, you know, tortilla chips. And then we have our beets. We're always looking at new recipe ideas and new inspiration. And we do have one in the books, uh, one we're cooking up right now. So hopefully we'll be able to launch that sometime in early 2022. Well, stay tuned for that, of course, on their website at hummusgoodness.com. Hannah, Laura, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Again, you can learn more information about Hummus Goodness and find all the locations where they sell their product here in the state of Michigan by going to their website at hummusgoodness.com. That is also where you can find those recipes, including the one that they reviewed with us earlier on today in this interview, uh, as well as many others. They have an entire page of these recipes, and you can also uh, sign up for, for emails from them as well to get more recipes as they add them there and more information about their products. Again, hummusgoodness.com. And if you're just tuning in, you want to learn more about them, you've missed this interview, of course, you can find all of our interviews as well as our full episodes on demand, usually by mid to late afternoon during our regular business hours of Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. on our website, civiccentertv.com. Just click on the Megacast link or log in civiccentertv.com slash megacast and about halfway down the page, if you click on watch full interviews or watch full episodes, you'll be able to find our full episodes and our interviews on demand and watch them anytime that you uh, that is convenient 
for you. We're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we'll be joined by uh, members of the Guys Upstairs comedy troupe. They will join us next to talk about some of their upcoming performances, uh, as well as uh, the origins of this group here in Oakland County. That is coming up next. You're watching and listening to the Megacast. Can I ask you a question? Why did you get your kids vaccinated? It was hard for them to social distance, to be isolated from their friends. I want them to get back to school and sports games. So as a pediatrician, I recommend the vaccine to everyone I know. The boys lost a former teammate and classmate who was only 20 years old. It's been a devastating year. We want to get back to normalcy. Our daughter is really looking forward to being with her friends, being a kid. It's the Great Lakes water. And so what people do ends up in our waterways. Flushable wipes are just evil. <laughs> they should be thrown away. They're impossible to destroy, and then they can cause significant problems. One of the main things when you're cooking is to not dump fats, oils, and greases down your drains. They stick to the sides of pipes. They stick to everything they come in contact with. Don't put it down the sink. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. Two one one, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. health and other resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. We may come from different organizations, but we work together to protect the Huron River for everyone. Neighborhood storm drains carry water directly to local creeks and streams. No filters, no treatment. Storm drains also help reduce street flooding when it rains. So clearing storm drains and the areas nearby of trash and leaves helps keep them for rain only. It is easy to do your part by adopting a storm drain. Find a storm drain, check it, and clear it every month. So keep storm drains for rain only. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. We as Michiganders feel connected to this resource in a way that I think is really powerful. Conservation starts with a caring, committed community. For me, you know, it's peaceful to have a relationship with the river. Every single one of us has a role to make sure that those waterways stay safe and healthy, being careful about what goes down the storm drain. Just even eliminating some of your single-use plastic makes a difference. There's one water, and it's ours to protect. People are getting out to walk and bike in higher numbers. More vulnerable road users and higher speed traffic can be a dangerous combination. Crash severity has increased, so if you're driving, be sure to slow down and look for people. There's no need to speed. If you're biking, ride with traffic. If you're walking, avoid stepping into the road if possible. If you have to walk in the street, walk facing traffic. Learn more at walkbikedrivesafe.org. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. 211, how can I help you? Our guides are ready to connect you with the help you need. Resources. Call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected, get help.
parents do a lot of worrying. Get your kids caught up on childhood vaccines to protect them from these 14 preventable diseases, and you'll have 14 fewer things to worry about. Vaccines are safe and effective and save lives. So let's get caught up on vaccines and worry about something else. Get the facts at ivaccinate.org. Welcome back to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keeft here in our studios in West Bloomfield Township where we broadcast live Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon on our live shows and throughout the week for replays as well. Learn more information about all the places we broadcast live and live to tape on our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. There you'll also find all of our interviews on demand. We're joined now by Jeff Priscorn and Emily Clark and soon we'll be joined by Clint Lohman. He's a uh, uh, currently trying to connect uh, from the guys upstairs improv comedy troupe but hey you know they're an improv troupe so in the meantime while we wait for Clint we'll improvise and get them and get yeah. the interview started Jeff Emily thanks for being with us today thanks for Thank having us for having us this is great appreciate having you on so tell us a little bit about the guys upstairs improv comedy troupe how did it form what kind of uh, different improv comedy do you guys perform Okay, well, we have all got backgrounds at, uh, we still studied at Second City back in the day. Uh, we came together, we all met each other at um, a theater in Ferndale. We did a, we did shows there, family shows for a few years. And then after uh, we left there, we branched off and um, started doing shows in Pontiac. And we've been doing shows there regularly for over four years now. And. It's been a heck of a lot of fun. Pontiac, we've seen Pontiac grow as uh, we've been there. It's, it's pretty cool. Guys Upstairs is uh, North Oakland County's longest running improv comedy show and open jam Fridays at 8 p.m. at uh, Experimentation Brewing in Pontiac, Saturdays at 8 p.m. at the Rustic Leaf Brewing in Waterford, and Fridays at Bagley Central in Detroit. Uh, they're slated to do improv. Uh, they're in this, uh, slated to do improv on October 15th and 29th, performing Campfire Tales at e e exper Experimentation in br uh, Brewing in downtown Pontiac. So tell us a little bit about Campfire Tales. What can people expect on October 15th and on October 29th when they go out? to see the show Emily? well there will be a costume uh theme so everybody oh. will want to wear their best scary um costumes or funny costumes and we will be doing um we'll get we'll get oh look there's clint we'll get <laughs> suggestions from the audience and we will form um improvised campfire scary friends tales uh on stage based on the audience suggestions yeah basically we're creating horror movies that have never been made before based on a title that the audience gives us and um we st we did started doing this about two years ago and uh last year we couldn't because of pandemic and no performances but we're bringing it back this october so and we have some great um co comedians that will be coming um, I don't have their names. Do you have their names, Jeff? I think it's Chris Morgan tomorrow. Chris Morgan. Um, definitely. Yeah, we typically have uh, either another improv troupe or some stand-up comedians that open up the show for us, and then we go on and do our show for about 90 minutes. Um, when we're not doing the campfire things in October, we have uh, begun doing a improvised game show. We bought a prize wheel, so we have the audience spin, and we just play all sorts of fun games and at the end of it we uh pick a winner from the audience and they get a nice gift bag from the guys upstairs and again that show is october 15th and 29th uh, the guys upstairs will be performing their campfire tales at experimentation brewing in downtown pontiac the show begins at eight o'clock and the cost at the door is ten dollars so uh we've talked about how the guys upstairs formed uh what where does the name the guys upstairs come from <laughs> I'm assuming somebody was downstairs we, at the time. <laughs> well, we were playing in a space, and we thought that we might be going upstairs in that space. Um, there was a lot of work to do in the upstairs space, and so we thought it would be really fun to call ourselves the guys upstairs. It seemed like a generic type of name that 
<laughs> and it's kind of relatable. It was yeah. an aspirational name as well. Aspirational name. Good. Good call. <laughs> um, yeah. So that, but we actually never went into the upstairs space. Uh, we remained on the main floor, but we still say it, it works because there's at least one step up onto the stage. So yes, it so still works. Technically, yeah. Technically, you are still up works. a stairs, uh, up a stair. If you walk up, you got to make it work multiple somehow. times. You know, <laughs> then you technically are up multiple stairs. It's fine. It all works yeah. out. Yeah. We're joined by the guys upstairs: Jeff Priscorn, Emily Clark, and Clint Lohman uh, from the, the uh, from North Oakland County's longest-running improv comedy troupe. You can see their upcoming show, Campfire Tales, both tomorrow, October 15th, and on October 29th, both Friday shows at 8 p.m. at Experimentation Brewing in downtown Ponte. Yeah, the cost at the door is ten dollars. So, uh, you mentioned earlier about how the pandemic. You touched on briefly or earlier how the pandemic impacted, of course, uh, having sh the ability to have shows uh, in person. Over the course of the pandemic, how did your comedy troupe adjust? Uh, were you still able to perform? And if so, how did that look during the pandemic as opposed to normal conditions like now? Uh, we did not perform uh, really live at all. There was a bunch of other improvisers in the Detroit area that were trying to do different things online, and a few of us would pop into those, like they had open jam nights from time to time, um, which while keeping your chops up a little bit is still not anything like you know, performing for a live audience. Uh, we we definitely, we, we met online a lot, the five of us, um, and us, we added a six, my wife actually joined us, um, and talked a lot about what we would do when we restarted, and that kind of was the impetus for, for us creating the game show and everything. So we've, we've revamped and made a better show technically and uh, more fun, but uh, yeah, the pandemic definitely stopped us in our tracks from performing so so then, still not gonna rust off yeah so then as individual performers and even as a comedy troupe without performing during the pandemic how did you how, how did you scratch that that the itch of com of comedy performance uh during oh, that time I was because it's a, it, because it, yeah. it's a it's it's an art but it's also yeah. a, a mo it's also something of joy for performers as well and everybody that yeah. is a performer on the stage whether it be comedy whether it be theater or, or anything else they always have that bug to get back up you there. have to you have to get it out it's it's part of you and i would take it out on my family and just be cracking jokes all the time <laughs> they had to live with me through the pandemic you know having it <laughs> clint you have to unmute yourself yes you press on the microphone yes yes um me personally what i uh, my wife and i are uh kind of like the ad hoc marketing team for a startup company and so we started uh writing and uh directing and producing short commercials for for this new company so we're making them as funny as possible and just uh scratching our production itch as well as our comedy itch doing that kind of thing so um wasn't necessarily improvising but it was still you know trying to connect with an audience and writing and stuff so then for for, for each of you um what why improv comedy ultimately is your outlet for performance what drew you to improv as opposed to other forms of comedy or other forms of performance Clint, what do you think well uh you know it's uh it's always very appealing to not have to memorize any lines or yes. uh, mm -hmm. yes. be off the book or uh, the repetition of saying the uh, the same act every time you perform can uh, really get on you. So, yeah, the fact that it's new uh, every time is really fresh. And then uh, Emma, yeah, I think it's, yeah, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> I think it's a great way to connect with people too because you're working with a group, um, and then you're also working with an audience. So it's this fantastic energy. Um, it's spontaneous, and it's really a great way to use, keep your mind fresh. And then, Jack yeah, uh, one of the one of the things that we all learned uh, when we were coming up in the improv world is that you got to have uh, you know reference level for everything that's going on in pop culture and stuff. So because. People are going to shout out all the you know the current cultural things as suggestions. You have to kind of know what those are to make them work on stage. And so that 
that kind of helps you uh, stay connected to real life as an improviser because you have to always be up on things. And I totally agree with what Clint and Emily also said, just about it being spontaneous and connecting with an audience immediately instead of just, you know, if you're doing a stage play, sure, you, you hold for applause and then you go back, but you're not, you're not interacting with them. So you're creating something every night and interacting with people and, and, and yeah, and playing with teammates who understand and get you and make, want to make you look better and you want to make them look better. So. We're joined by the Guys Upstairs Comedy Troupe, Improv Comedy Troupe. They are North Oakland County's longest-running improv comedy show uh, and open jams. You can uh, find them coming up uh, at their Campfire Tales presentation Friday, October 15th and, uh, and Friday, October 29th at Experimentation Brewing in downtown Pontiac. The show starts at 8 p.m. and the cost at the door, $10 to join them uh, for their improv comedy show. And for for people that go and, they, and see comedy or they, they watch a, uh, an improv comedy show, uh, and, uh, whether in person on the stage or on, or on TV or some other form of, of, uh, of media, uh, oftentimes they'll think, oh, I could do that. Uh, to do it, but doing it and doing it well are two completely different things. It is an art, but it also is something that you have to have some practice at and really uh, develop into a skill. For those that would be interested in dabbling in uh, improv comedy, what goes into being a quality improv comic uh, individually, but also uh, as a tandem as well? Um, number one is exercising your listening skills. You know, the, the, there are basic rules of improv that everybody learns. It's, you know, don't deny, yes and. Um, so you're always trying to build on what somebody says. So you have, to, you have to be listening to what they're saying so that you can build on it. Um, I, think, I think too, um, it's a matter of taking things step by step. When you're learning as an improviser, you know, first you need to get comfortable with um, like Jeff said, agreeing with other people, but sometimes it's just starting with working with object work. Um, what does a teacup look like? You know, how do you use a teacup? <laughs> um, and then from there, building on your skills a little bit at a time to where you're very solid in your self presentation and then also your listening skills. Um, and then you wanna work on story and what makes this interesting? What makes today different? So then in terms of your performances uh, as a improv comedy troupe, uh, because improv comedy, you may have, uh, in some cases like Campfire Tales, you're going in with a similar concept, or your game show, you're going in with a similar concept, but it's improv. It's gonna be different every single time. And so to prepare as a troupe, to continue uh, to build that chemistry and to build that rapport so that you can create these quality shows. How does a comedy troupe like yours go about rehearsing or go about practicing and develop, continuing to develop those skills to put on these quality shows? I think a lot outside of just even rehearsing, a lot of it is just the fact that we've been together so long, we trust each other. Yeah. You know, we, we trust that, you know, if I say something dumb, somebody's gonna come in and fix it or, you know, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Um, but you know there are there are warm up exercises that we do uh, before shows um, just to kind of get us out of our heads so that we're not pre planning anything. It's just you know just reacting. We're joined by Jeff Prisco and Emily Clark and Clint Lohman from the Guys Upstairs Improv Comedy Troupe. They have a couple of upcoming shows, Friday, October 15th, and Friday, October 29th at Experimentation Brewing in downtown Pontiac, where they will be presenting Campfire Tales. Uh, and you can join them at 8 p.m. Uh, on those dates, and it is $10 to get in the door. So when people come to the show, uh, they are going to be in, in some way participating. They'll be providing ideas. They'll, they'll be providing uh, some different situations to your comedy troupe as you tell these horror stories entirely improvised for them uh, on each of these show days. So how should the audience prepare as they come out there to, to be as helpful as possible to the guys upstairs, but also to be prepared to enjoy the show and have a really fun time at Campfire Tales? They should get a beer and just relax. <laughs> you could, yeah, that's one, one that's of a great way to prepare. With our performances prepare. and experiment, with our performances and experimentation, we do give them a ticket when they buy when they buy their ticket, and that ticket gets them half off their second drink. So there's there's even that for them. But 
I love that. I don't think I've ever, ever been asked, how do you, how do you, how would an audience prepare for an improv show? That's a great question, Tyler. It is. Wear, wear a costume, drink a beer, um, and be silly. Yeah. And... But no, no suggestions about things like gynecologists and your typical things. Try to, try to be creative with your suggestions to make us think. Now keep your gynecology oh, suggestions yeah. for your OBGYN. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Probably the best way to go about it. So we're joined by Jeff Friskorn, Emily Clark, and Clint Lohman from the Guys Upstairs comedy troupe. They have an upcoming show, uh, both Friday, October 15th and 29th at uh, Experimentation Brewing in downtown Pontiac. That show is at 8 p.m. Uh, and, and the cost is $10. So just another couple minutes with the three of you before we'll say goodbye today. Is there anything else uh, that would be interesting for our audience to know about uh, your improv comedy troupe, either about camp Campfire Tales or other upcoming shows beyond Campfire Tales that people should be on the lookout for in the future? Um, well, you mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, what, what it takes for training to be an improviser, and that's something that we've been looking to get into as well, uh, is uh, starting up workshops for uh, as the guys upstairs to teach teach people. We've had a, we had a bunch of people that continuously come out and see us, and they've always, you know, they, they get up with, during our improv jams, they get up and uh, they improve from week to week. It's really great to see. So that's one of the things we're hoping to do. Um, Clint is the mastermind of that, of the that kind of uh, workshop stuff. But keep an eye out for that on our Facebook page and our Instagram. Um, yeah, I come out and have fun. I did we're think of one fun. other, I did think of one other thing that people might want to plan for when they come out to the show okay. is sign up for the jam get up there and try it um because it's not scary we will keep you safe and we're not going to make you do anything that's too uncomfortable for you um, and you might find that you like it and you might find that you like improv and want to kind of explore improv a little bit it's like playing on a playground when you are an adult <laughs> so, so clint tell us a little bit uh, about the jam when people are participating in what what is that like what are they experiencing when they do ultimately stand up and volunteer to participate in your comedy jam well yeah what we'll do is we'll have them come up and uh play an improv game so first they'll they'll sign up and uh we'll call a couple people up and explain how to play that particular game and it'll go for about three to five minutes um there's a lot of different uh improv games that uh we have to play during the jam and you know one fun thing that we do just to keep it fresh is uh uh, we offer uh, if if uh, audience member thinks of a, a fun game uh, to play as a improv game, we welcome um, any new thoughts or ideas to uh, to do that during the jam. Uh, but yeah, uh, so any uh, anyone is allowed to uh, sign up and play, and it um, you know it's usually something real quick, about three to five minutes that they'll play, and they usually want to come back and play again if if they've done it before well if you want to join them for their comedy for their comedy show and open jam you can visit them uh 8, 8 p.m on fridays at experimentation brewing in pontiac and, and that's also where you'll see campfire tales coming up on october 15th and 29th you can also find them saturdays at 8 p.m at rustic leaf brewing in waterford and fridays at bagley central uh, in detroit as well we appreciate having the three of you on thanks for joining us today Thanks Thank for you, having Tyler. us. It's been great. Happy Halloween. Yes, Spooky to Halloween. you as too. Yes. To you also. And happy Halloween and, uh, uh, and good luck with your upcoming shows. Thank you, Thank sir. you. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Yep. Thank you to the guys upstairs for joining the guy with the voice. We're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we'll, ca we'll cap off today's edition of the Megacast uh, and be joined by Make-A-Wish of Michigan. Uh, they'll be joining us next on the Megacast here. We'll come back after this short break. <laughs> One of the things you can look for in your friends is a change in behavior. These can be big changes, they can be small changes in mood, physical appearance, they may be sleeping less or sleeping more, and drinking more, or their eating patterns may be different. One big change that can be pretty obvious is change in motivation. Do they no longer want to play basketball? Do they no longer want to play video games? 
Now that we're spending more time online and in virtual settings, it's really important to pay attention to the language that your friend is using and the words they're using to communicate. So when we text our friends, are they taking longer amounts of time to respond? Are they not responding at all? You don't have to be an expert to try to recognize these signs. The second that you feel it in your gut and that you're concerned, that's a second to have the conversation and open the door to what might be going on. Whatever, whatever, whatever Today, it is easier than ever to join Michigan's Organ Donor Registry and help build a bridge of hope for organ, tissue, and eye donation. Just one person can potentially save or help improve the lives of up to 75 people. By joining, your legacy could be the gift of life. Sign up today at michigan.gov SOS or at any of the more than 145 Secretary of State self-service stations located across Michigan. Be part of Michigan's Bridge of Hope by adding your name to the organ donor registry. When times get dark, we can't see the help that's all around us. When you don't know where to turn, let 211 be your guiding light. are ready to connect you with the help you need. For help with food, health care, mental health, and other resources, call 211 or visit 211.org. 211. Get connected. Get help. to the Megacast. I'm Tyler Keefe alongside studio producer and board operator Calvin Brown here in our studios at Green Media Center in West Bloomfield Township. But we're broadcasting all across the state of Michigan on a number of different outlets on TV, on radio, and on the web. Find more information about all of those places you can find us uh, and everything else that they do in the other 22 hours of the day that they're broadcasting by going to our website at civiccentertv.com slash megacast. There you'll also find all of our interviews on demand, including our final interview today. We're pleased to be joined now by Ashley San Regret. She is the Dev Development and Communications Officer for Make-A-Wish of, of West Michigan, and she joins us now uh, on the Megacast. Ashley, thanks for being with us today. Hey, Tyler. Thanks for having me. I'm appreciate, happy to be here. Appreciate having you on. So you have an upcoming event tomorrow, October 15th. Uh, Make-A-Wish will be holding a virtual event called World of Imagination, The Journey of a Wish. Tell us a little bit about this virtual event and how people can join. Yes, we're very excited about our virtual event. It is free to all of you that register. It's the um, last event of our Hope is Essential, our Hope is Essential virtual series that we had this year. You know, we had to look at our events and what we would usually host in person, but we said we have powerful, incredible stories to share, and we know that we can do that virtually. So uh, we came together as a team, and we've created World of Imagination, Journey of a Wish. It's a free virtual event that anybody, if you're ever interested in what's going on in Michigan and how um, kids are having their wishes granted, this is the time to join. It's about a 40 minute program that really walks you through the wish granting process all the way from the referrals to the volunteers to the wish kids telling their stories of anticipation to the wishes being granted. Every voice is heard during this virtual event. And we're really excited to share it with everyone. Yeah, so you get to learn a little bit about what goes into some of these uh, some, sometimes very simple wishes and sometimes a little bit more elaborate wishes, all that end up being from an organizational standpoint and from a community standpoint, a, con a really a really concerted effort and a, uh, and a big effort from a number of different people to grant a wish to, uh, to a child and, and you get a little bit of a greater insight into just what goes into that because we see these videos and we, and we see the end result but we often don't hear a whole lot about what goes into that from the start to that finish point. Yeah, I think it's really um, a really cool thing. I know when I was when I before I was a staff member and I was first a volunteer, I couldn't believe how tangible 
uh, the wish experience is for volunteers. Our volunteers are the ones that are two trained wish granting volunteers that meet with wish kids, that meet and ask them the question, if you could wish for anything, what would you wish for? And they get to be a part of that journey and a part of that experience along the wish process. And I think that kind of blows people's minds that kids, uh, volunteers are working directly with our wish kids. Donors that are donating their dollar funds are going directly to grant wishes for Michigan kids. That's the other thing. Make-A-Wish Michigan is not government funded. We are solely funded by incredible individuals, corporations, uh, school groups that come together that raise money to grant the vital funds for kids right in our backyard. We're joined by Ashley Sandrogat, the Development and Communications uh, Officer at Make-A-Wish Michigan uh, in their West Michigan chapter. She joins us now uh, to talk, uh, joining us now to talk about their upcoming virtual uh, virtual event called World of Imagination, The Journey of a Wish. You can learn more information and find the live stream on its website, worldofimaginationmi. Dot org. That again, worldofimaginationmi.org, where you can also make donations. And those donations, uh, when you do make a donation, thanks to their sp ma uh, match sponsor, Arby's Foundation, all donations up to $50,000 will be matched. And you can also participate in a silent auction as well. What are some of the things that people will be able to be bidding on in that silent auction that, of course, benefits Make-A-Wish of Michigan? Uh, silent auctions open right now too, and people are eagerly bidding as we speak. So we're not waiting until tomorrow night to open that silent auction. It's now. Get on there, check it out. Um, there's some cool Detroit Red Wings, Tigers packages in there. There's a Traverse City Sunset Cruise. Um, get on there. There's some things that even I'm keeping an eye on to see. Uh, the silent auction will be open until 5 p.m. on Sunday. So uh, definitely check it out. There's some fun stuff on there. Yeah, a lot of fun stuff there. And again, that is World of Imagination MI. Dot org if you'd like to learn more about some of the items that they are auctioning off and get on that it's all it's already underway and, and it all is ultimately going toward a good cause and you'll be able to maybe get a really good experience out of that as well should you win any of those auctions we're joined by ashley sand we'll get the development and communications officer at make a wish of michigan uh, and she's joining us to talk about again their upcoming event tomorrow night uh, tomorrow uh, and what time of the day it is tomorrow night it is 7 30 yeah. p.m friday yeah. october 15th just want to make sure i didn't misspeak on that friday october 15th uh, at 7 30 p.m on world of imagination mi.org where you can join them for world of imagination the journey of a wish and so um ashley as we talk about these donations and as we talk about about proceeds that are going to uh toward uh helping make a wish provide these wishes and grant these wishes to these kids uh, that are that are dealing with a critical illness. Uh, how, do, how, how much of an impact does this have on these kids as they're going through the process of battling this Ill, uh, battling uh, these chronic uh, these chronic or these uh, critical illnesses uh, and what, what kind of impact does that have on their recovery process or on their treatment process and maybe even does that impact the success of those outcomes in some cases sure we know that there's um now new studies that have come out about the medical impact of a wish. And we had an event back in April that was just our medical professionals from across the country talking about their experience and that the impact of a wish plays on uh, wish kids. And they are seeing um, when the wish is just introduced to a wish kid, just that anticipation of having a wish and knowing that they have something to look forward to is not only changing conversations um, instead of people saying, oh, how are you feeling? How's it going? They're saying, oh, I heard that you get to get a wish. What are you thinking about? And it's switching conversations. It's also showing um, our uh, Dr. Fauner, our um, doctor and our chapter medical advisor, he said, he says it so beautifully that wishes are part of the medical journey that he can't prescribe. He can prescribe it. He can refer a wish, but it's part of the medical healing of a child that's facing a critical illness. These kids are losing their childhood when they are diagnosed with a critical illness. And so a wish is bringing that back. This last year, uh, we've been able to grant wishes for playset wishes, puppies, above ground swimming pools, and to watch these videos that are going to be shown tomorrow night in the um, World of Imagination Journey of a Wish event, you're going to hear directly from Wish families about how the Wish has personally affected their family. And you can see the smiles on the Wish kids' faces when you see them enjoying their Wish. 
We're joined by Ashley Sandberg, the Development and Communications Officer at Make-A-Wish of Michigan. Joining us on the Megacast, you can learn more again about their event tomorrow at 7.30 p.m., uh, The Journey of a Wish, by visiting worldofimaginationmi.org. That is also where you can make donations, where up to $50,000 uh, donations, uh, a cumulative donation of up to $50,000 will be matched by their match sponsor, Arby's Foundation. And you can also bid on a number of different interesting items, including uh, rock superstars, autographed electric guitar, a sunset sale for two in Traverse City, a Detroit Red Wings, and Detroit Tigers experience. So you can go on the ice and then on the diamond as well. You can register uh, to participate in the free event and learn more or become a sponsor. Again, worldofimagination.mi. Uh, Dot org. That is worldofimaginationmi.org, uh, where you can find more about that. And so, uh, uh, Ashley, here in the state of Michigan, and uh, in, in Make-A-Wish Michigan, uh, Michigan chapter, when uh, how, are, how are children able to participate in uh, having their wish granted? How do families go about uh, reaching out to the organization? Does the organization find these families? How does that process work? And then where does it go from there? to then uh, receive their wish and start working to grant it. Awesome, yes, our, um, we are granting wishes for kids between the ages of two and a half and 18 years old. And a child has to be referred into our, our Make-A-Wish program in order to receive a wish and become eligible. We work directly with hospitals across the state of Michigan and other referral sources that help um, refer kids to our Make-A-Wish program. Also, um, what's kind of fun is that wish kids themselves can call in and start the referral process. So those are fun calls that we get sometimes that are some of our teenagers that say, hey, I think I qualify for a wish. We actually had a wish kid that was messaging us from um, the hospital room on a social media platform uh, saying, hey, how do I get a wish? Uh, so wish kids can uh, refer themselves, medical professionals, um, parents can start the referral process, and then a family member that has extensive knowledge about a wish or about their um, the critical illness, they can start the referral process. But ultimately, we work directly with the child's treating physician to um, work with our eligibility criteria. Once a child becomes eligible for Make-A-Wish, they are assigned wish-granting volunteers. And again, our wish-granting volunteers are two trained volunteers in the community that sign up for a wish kid, and they're the ones that get to ask the ultimate question, if you could wish for anything, what would you wish for? And they're also the ones that are part of the child's wish process, that they're keeping the kids excited about their upcoming wish. So maybe they're doing touch points once a month to do something exciting um, and just keeping their wish top of mind. And uh, so once our volunteers go in and find out what they want for their wish, our wish coordinators that are staff members start planning the wish. So they work in tandem with our wish granting volunteers. They're doing more of the logistics stuff while the wish granters are really the boots on the ground for us, the ones that are front facing with our wish families. And really we see, I heard from a wish, um, a wish kid that's now a wish alum, he talks about the dreaming process. So the anticipation of his wish being granted it's something that he said really got him through the next treatment, really gave him the, uh, that light and the end of the tunnel when he was so uncertain about what that tunnel was going to look like. So it was very narrow for him. He was very sick. He had multiple spinal taps, hair loss, sickness, hospitalizations. But once he was able to start shifting his focus on that anticipation of his wish, he says it so beautifully that that really gave him the hope that he needed to keep going and to have the strength to get through. And once those wishes are granted, um, we have a lot of families that are still staying in touch and wishing it forward, which to me is so inspiring when families, after they've had their wishes granted, they come back and they say, hey, we wanna make sure other wish kids are having their wishes granted too. How can we help? And that's the power of a wish. We're joined by Ashley Sandberg, the Development and Communications Officer at Make-A-Wish of Michigan. She's joining us again to talk about uh, their upcoming event, Friday, October 15th. That is tomorrow at 7.30 p.m. It's a virtual event. Uh, World of Imagination, the Journey of a Wish. You can participate uh, and learn more and learn more about donating and uh, 
and bidding in their in their in their auction by going to their website world of imagination mi dot org and uh, Ashley a few more minutes with you today before we'll say goodbye uh, and before that you mentioned volunteers and, and and the work that they do in in uh, with Make a Wish of Michigan if people are interested in volunteering uh, what volunteer opportunities are there and how do people get involved then to be able to volunteer with Make a Wish of Michigan. Yeah, so our volunteer experience is incredibly tangible. I would encourage you to go to michigan.wish.org. That's our main website to, uh, and click on our volunteer tab. Check out some of our volunteer stories, but also you can start your application process to become a volunteer. Like I mentioned before, you can be a wish granting volunteer, one that um, pairs up with another wish granting volunteer and you get to be directly connected to the wish process and the wish experience with our wish kids. Also, um, we are really hoping in 2023 we will have in-person events and we have some really awesome events coming up. Uh, we have our Walk for Wishes in Detroit and we need volunteers for that. Uh, and then we'll have um, our Wish Ball in West Michigan. And then we have a 300 mile three day bike tour that starts in Traverse City and ends up in um, Eaton, at Eaton uh, Proving Grounds actually. And it's a 300 mile three day bike event that is so powerful and we need lots of volunteers for that event. So if you're interested in volunteering, again, go to michigan.wish.org, click on the volunteer tab, just even call us. If you're just interested in getting involved, we'd love to hear from you, we'd love to chat with you. We're joined by Ashley Sandvergret, the Development and Communications Officer at Make-A-Wish of Michigan. Again, if you want to learn more about their event tomorrow, October 15th at 7.30 p.m., a virtual event, World of Imagination, The Journey of a Wish. Find more information on that event and register to participate uh, by going to, the, to its website at worldofimaginationmi.org. That is worldofimaginationmi.org. Org and learn more about Make a Wish of Michigan and how you can volunteer. That is michigan.wish.org. Ashley, another minute with you before we'll say goodbye today. Anything else that would be important for people to know about tomorrow's event or about the work and the opportunities for volunteerism or, or uh, additional aid to Make a Wish of Michigan before we say goodbye today? Absolutely. You know, during this pandemic, we were able to really count on our greatest supporters and we were able to grant 364 wishes in our last fiscal year. But we know that 800 kids every year are being diagnosed with a critical illness and we need donor dollars. Every dollar that comes into the Make-A-Wish office is granting wishes for Michigan kids. And uh, there's so many ways that you can get involved. We'd love to talk with you and uh, join us tomorrow night. It's a free event. You have nothing to lose, but so much to gain from such an inspirational event tomorrow night. Join us, check it out, and we'd love to hear back from you. Yeah, learn more information about that event and how you can uh, donate and participate in a fundraising uh, efforts such as their silent auction by going to worldofimaginationmi.org and learn more about the organization at michigan.wish.org so that they can continue to provide uh, to, to grant wishes like they did last year with 364 wishes that is almost a wish a day and they'd love to do a lot more ashley thank you for joining us today Thank you, Tyler, so much for having me. Appreciate it. Again, learn more, michigan.wish.org. And that event tomorrow night, 7.30 p.m., virtual event at World of Imagination, M-I. Org. Big thank you to all of our guests today as we wrap up the show. Ashley Sandrogat, of course, the Development and Communications Officer with Make-A-Wish of Michigan. Hannah Awada and Lara Loser from um, Hummus Goodness uh, as well. Nicholas Christock, the Founder and Executive Director of Fleece and Thank You, uh, as well as, uh, as our good friends from the Guys Upstairs Improv Comedy Troupe, Jeff Priscorn, Emily Clark, and Clint Lohman, and of course, Sarah Shang from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention of Medicine. Detroit for joining us on today's edition of the show. If you missed any of our interviews today, you can find all of them on our website, civiccentertv.com slash megacast. That is also where you'll find more information about everybody that participates in our show, all the different community television and radio outlets, as well as web outlets all across the state of Michigan that join us for our live shows and throughout the afternoon for replays each and every day, Monday through Friday, uh, with us here on the MegaCast. Big thank you to our crew as well, Larry Nyland, our booking producer and our Zoom producer, filling all the time slots for our show with interesting guests 
every single day and then getting them ready and, and helping them through all the technical issues that go into dealing with Zoom and getting on a virtual show like this. He does, he does amazing work behind the scenes. Also, Calvin Brown, studio producer and board operator, joining me here in the studios each and every day, going through the painstaking experience of being in the same room as me for two hours a day, five days a week. And big thank you to him. Yeah, as he audibly groans to my right over here. You can learn more information about our show again, civiccentertv.com slash megacast at, at our coronavirus page. Find information from the CDC, the MDHHS, and the Oakland County Health Division and our top stories each and every day. Coming up next on Civic Center TV, it's The Splash with Maddie Mushkin on My Michigan TV. It is Steve Leto live, and we will be back tomorrow morning live at 10 a.m.